Welcome and everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Garo Batmanian. Thank you for joining our session on landscape biodiversity for healthy people and healthy economies. In this session, we are going to talk about how the COVID pandemic has brought new attention to the importance of landscape health for human health. We will look at pathways for spillover of zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19 from animals to humans and landscape management actions that we can take to minimize or stop the spillover. We will ask about, we will talk about the importance of healthy ecosystems for jobs and economic growth. For example, in many cases, uh, nature and wildlife provide the basis for nature-based tourism that provides important income for protected area management and for jobs for local communities. So nature-based uh, tourism is the anchor to maintain the integrity in, of, of some or many of the conservation areas in the world. We are also going to talk about the strategies to bring back nature tourists when the world recovers from COVID and what can be done in the meantime to help communities that depend on tourists for their livelihoods. We're also going to talk about how to maintain the landscape integrity so that we decrease the risk of pandemic. Before we start, uh, before I introduce today's speakers, I have a few questions to test our, our, out our knowledge on bad biodiversity and the transfer of zoonotic diseases to people. First, mm -hmm. if you are not already familiar with Slido, here are the steps for using the tool. You can see it on the screen. We're gonna ask you two questions and please go ahead and do it. Uh, you go, to, okay. Uh, I'll give you a moment to sign in on Slido. And our first question is, how many bat species are there worldwide? Okay. We haven't received any responses yet. I'll wait, them. I'll wait for some time for people to respond. So guys, how many bat species are there worldwide? Take a wild guess. Brooklyn and Arena, you are not allowed to respond. I don't see anybody responding. Okay, now we got it. Okay, it's still going on. Okay, I think we can stop now. Well, actually there are 14, 14 1,400, around 4,000, 1,400 species of bats that we know of already identified. So the question, the, the answer is the number two where 25% got it right. Uh, now I'll move to the second question. How many emerging infectious diseases come from animals? Okay, we have a tight race between 67 and 33. Uh, I'll give more time for people to respond. No more answers. I think the numbers are more or less correct. Uh, now we're going to 50 and 50. Well, it may surprise you, people, but it's 75%. 75% of emerging infectious diseases from what we call zoonotic origin came from animals, either wildlife or livestock. Uh, Ebola, uh, MERS, SARS, H1N1, COVID, all of them come from, uh, start from animals. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, may I have the next step, I hope, we can increase your knowledge about these topics by the end of this session. Can I have the, the next slide, please? So before introducing uh, the speakers, I also want to present why we're doing this, why we're talking about landscape biodiversity and health and COVID. And as you can see, this is a study from uh, Allen in 2017 in the, in the journal nature and the yellow is the is this a heat maps based on they have 18 predictors 
And based on the predicted, uh, on those predictors, the relative risk of distribution of zoonotic environmental, oh, I'm sorry, emerging infectious disease events, you can see where is the highest places. So this was 2017. It doesn't say COVID-19, but it says the risk of emerging infectious diseases, and you can see where they are. Now, if I go to the next slide, please. They use, they use four, uh, 18 different predictors to calculate that map that I show you, the heat map that I show you. And if you look at the top five, out of the top five, four of them are related with the environment. Is integrity or evergreen broad trees? Is the impact of climate change? Is the mammal biodiversity? And the land use, because it's cultivated managed vegetation. All of those are uh, environment or animals related. So four of the top five predictors are for the next risk of pandemic, our environment. So I think this gives you a pretty good idea of why we have to talk about biodiversity and landscapes uh, in more detail uh, within the scope of One Health and the next pandemic, or the, the risk of the next pandemic. So without further ado, I would like to go, it's my pleasure to introduce our session speakers. First, we would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Raina Plowright. Raina is an associate professor of microbiology and immunology at Montana State University. Originally from Australia, uh, from Australia, she is an expert in the dynamics of disease systems that connect human and animal populations. She is trained as an infectious disease ecologist, epidemiologist, and wildlife ve veterinarian. Raina research focuses on dynamics of zoological pathogens in wildlife population the transmission of pathogens across the species barriers and links between environmental stressors and pathogen emergence. Rhino leads a collaboration of more than 70, 70, 70 scientists known as Bat One Health, working to prevent pathogen transmission from bats to humans. This group is spread across five continents, has ongoing field studies in Australia, Bangladesh, Madagascar, Ghana, and focuses on the World Health Organization priority pathogens that are emerging from bats in humans, including the Henipa virus and coronavirus viruses, as well as other wildlife pathogen systems that have human health and conservation implications. Uh, later, we're going to hear from Brooklyn Hunt, uh, a student of the same Montana State University and research assistant of Dr. Plyer Wright who will give us a tour of their laboratory and also a window of their field work through a video such, uh, through a video. Uh, and then we we'll next, we hear from Daniel Mirasalam uh, from our own World Bank. She, he's a senior environmental specialist at the World Bank based in Beijing about how One Health approach is helping to reduce the risk of zoonotic diseases in China. Daniel holds a PhD from University of Manchester on atmospheric physics and a master's degree in chemical environmental engineering, but he works on <laughs> infectious diseases as well. Uh, we then we want to focus on, we're going to have our also another good friend from the bank, Urvashina Rage. She is the lead economist for the World Bank Environment, Natural Resources and Blue Economy uh, Global Practice. And she's going to talk about the tools and resources to help nature-based tourists recovery from post-COVID-19. Uh, following this, I'll come back and open up for discussions. If you see that it's going to be a Q&A uh, box on your right on the screen, and if you paste your questions there instead of the, of the chat, that would be good because then we can later on, you can also vote on the questions since we're going to get many questions on the questions that will be answered are the ones that get most votes. Without further ado, uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Rana Prynlight to, to start. Give, give you the screen, not the floor. My name is Brooklyn Hunt and I'm an undergraduate here at Montana State University. The Blywright Lab is one lab within a global consortium of many labs known as Bat One Health. 
In Bat One Health, our goal is to understand the spillover of bat viruses and how that changes based on ecological landscape changes and land use. Within Bat One Health, we have collaborators all over the world. But specifically, we have field work sites where bats are actually caught and studied in Ghana, Bangladesh, Madagascar, and Australia. We specifically study Hendra virus in Australian flying foxes because it's really just an ideal system to understand spillover. So in order to do that, we study bat immune function, microbiomes, hematology, diet ecology, foraging behavior, and lots of other things. But specifically, my research examines the diets of black flying foxes because we're interested in how changes in habitat alters their diet composition and how diet change affects spillover. I also do a lot of hematology, which is the study of blood, because I want to expand our ability to gather information on bat health from blood samples. At the level of Hendra virus itself, we study how stable the virus is in different environmental conditions specifically how stable it is in different aerosol conditions. So I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Raina Plowright. She's going to tell you more about our work on Hendra virus and how we can apply our work and our findings to help stop bat virus spillover on a bigger scale. Thank you. Thank you, Brooklyn. Thank you for this video. Dr. Raina, the... Ryan, your the screen is yours. Excellent, thank you. And I think you are sharing the presentation. I actually see you. Okay. <laughs> Great. If you can advance to the next slide, it will play a video. Thank you. This is Teropis medius here. It is a reservoir host of Nipah virus in Bangladesh. We studied the species in Bangladesh. It's also been responsible for Nipah virus outbreaks in um, India. Next slide, please. I'd first like to acknowledge this wonderful team of scientists and students, postdocs and technicians that work around the world. Brooklyn has already given a good introduction to our work, so we can go to the next slide. We're focused on three questions. We, we're really wanting to develop the scientific basis for the prevention of pathogen spillover. And we'll do that by answering these three questions. How do pandemics start? How do we predict them? And how can we prevent them? Next slide. We've seen many slides like this. There is an acceleration of the number of emerging disease events. And it's a, not a question of if, it's but when. And so many of these emerging diseases have their origins in a landscape context. Next slide. And so many of them have their origins in these creatures, bats. And we're focused on the, the pathogens that spill over from bats into humans. But I do want to say these bats, they're not the bad guys. Really, they're, they offer critical ecosystem services, ecosystem services that no other species can provide. And I think of them more as the canary rather than the cause. Next slide. So let's start with how pandemics slide, start next. Pandemics, they require four processes to happen. We have to have an infected reservoir host. And the infection processes in those reservoir hosts are very complicated. We have pathogen moving from host to host and population to population. We have upsurges in infections. We have troughs in infections. We also have to have that pathogen be released from that reservoir host either like in this picture here where it's shed in urine or feces, or it could be released through slaughter, bushmeat hunting. It could be released through a vector bite. And then there has to be a spillover process where the pathogen is passed from the animal into a human or often actually indirectly into another species before it gets into humans. And then to become a pandemic, it has to go supercritical. 
Supercritical means it has to be able to take off and spread in the next population, and certainly in the human population for a pandemic. That means it can't die out quickly in the first hosts. It can't kill the host too quickly. It, there are many, many conditions it needs to be able to meet to be able to spread in the human population. Next slide. And all of these processes are happening on landscapes, in the context of landscapes. And very often it's landscape change or land use change that is the trigger or the driver of these processes. Next slide. I'm going to introduce this concept of landscape immunity, and that is the ecological conditions that support the health of species in situ, that dampen high prevalence of disease and reduce the proximity of animals and humans. So in other words, the conditions on the landscape that reduce the risk of the infect, shed, spill, spread, cascade. And I have a, a, a preprint here link that you can look for more more uh, introduction to this concept. Next slide. So how, what do we know about the infect shed spill spread process for SARS-CoV-2? Well, certainly that cascade, it occurred. It had to occur to us to get to a pandemic, but how it occurred and where it occurred is very uncertain. The area where the species, closely related uh, species of uh, horseshoe bats that have the, the closest sequences to SARS-CoV-2 are in the Southeastern Asian area in that bottom circle there. This is an area of high human population density, high livestock population density, and high rates of landscape clearing and fragmentation. We don't know what the circumstances were for the spillover event, but it's likely that landscape change, land use change was some trigger at some point in this cascade. Next. How do we predict pandemics? There, SARS-CoV-2, let's put it in context. <clears throat> Three coronaviruses have spilled over into human populations that have a bat origin in the last 20 years. So the original SARS virus in 2003, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, which has gone from bats into camels, has now persisted in camels maybe for decades and now has emerged into humans. And then, of course, the pandemic uh, cause of, of COVID-19. What is challenging here is that all of these uh, emerging pathogens may have originated from a single spillover event from bats into an intermediate host that then led to human infection. And when we have those single spillover event, with it, we essentially have an N equals three for understanding spillover. So we can't build the data, we can't build the big patterns to really understand how this is happening. What are the root causes of this process? Next. And this is a problem in that we have many, many more pathogens, not only in bats, in many, many other species, but just looking at the coronaviruses in bats, we assume there are over 3000 coronavirus variants, at least a couple of hundred that are probably zoonotic, so can be transmitted to humans, and they have a wide distribution. So if we want to stop SARS-CoV-3, we need to start understanding what the triggers are of these epidemic processes. Next. So to understand spillover, we need to start to look to systems where spillover happens frequently, where we can build up those large patterns. And so we're looking at the Hennepa viruses because we see spillover every year. We see in Bangladesh, if you look on the y-axis, that's that space and on the x-axis time, every one of those dots is a spillover event. And then at the bottom, Hendra virus, it's in the same genus as Nipah virus within the Hennepah viruses. Hendra virus spills over in Australia. On the y-axis, that's the east coast of Australia. On the x-axis, you can see every one of those dots is a spillover event. So we now have the long-term patterns where we can try to understand how these processes happen. Next. Next. This here is, again, this is Teropus uh, medius in Bangladesh. 
uh, the host of Nipah virus. So we're studying Nipah virus. We see it spill over every year in Bangladesh. It doesn't transmit far along human chains. So we haven't seen any pandemics, only small epidemics. It's a WHO priority pathogen. And the concern is Nipah virus emerging in a place like Bangladesh that has a high human population density, poor public health infrastructure. But I want to emphasize in Bangladesh, Nipah is emerging in the context of an already transformed landscape. So bats in Bangladesh live within a very, very tightly uh, tight human context and have so for decades. Next slide. I'm going to go to Australia, where we have a very different situation. Nipah virus that emerges, that spills over from bats into horses and then to humans is spilling over in a context of rapid environmental change, rapid landscape change. So what we understand from Hendra virus is that it's, it's endemic. Well, that means that it lives within all four species of flying foxes. We call them flying foxes or fruit bats. They're primarily nectar feeding bats, but they will also eat fruit. And when flying foxes will feed in a tree in a horse paddock and defecate or urinate on the ground, contaminating the grass, Horses can then come along, graze on that grass and then become sick. Next. And it's humans treating horses, sick horses who are susceptible, who often will get the disease. There are few outbreaks in humans. Thankfully, um, by using appropriate PPE, veterinarians have become very aware of this issue with horses. And so we've had seven cases in, in humans, four have died, but that's a 60% fatality rate. Certainly many more horses have died and uh, with an 80% fatality rate. Next. But what's really interesting with Hendra, it emerged in 1994. So we've seen it for, um, for a, a, around 20 years. We have, we see it in clusters. So we see one or two years without any Hendra virus spillover. And then we'll see a whole lot of Hendra virus spillover in one place and one time. And I'll just draw your attention to the very last square here, 2017, where we saw four spillover events in a small area of Northern New South Wales. And the team, our team um, went to visit one of these spillover events. I wanna add to spillover is almost always in winter. Next. We visited a property of, of, of a horse that had died of Hendra virus. Next. That my whole team was here. We'd just been given a, an NSF grant to study this process. And we interviewed her, asked her about what happened. She said it was raining. Curiously, it's often raining during these, these spillover events. She said that a population of bats had just moved into a neighboring property and there was a severe food shortage. We were studying the bats at the time and there was a severe food shortage. Next. And because of that food shortage, the bats were coming into her lemon or, or um, orchard to feed on lemons, a food of last resort, a starvation avoidance food. Because it was raining, her horse's paddock had turned to mud. So she moved her horse into that lemon orchard. Because it was, um, there was this nutritional stress event in bats, we understand there's this link between nutritional stress and shedding Hendra virus. We know that those bats were shedding high levels of Hendra virus. And because it was raining and cold, we think the virus survived well on that grass for long enough for next her horse to come along and consume an infectious dose or inhale an infectious dose of Hendra virus and then would die from this, this disease. During, as we stood in the paddock, listening to her story, it was really quite extraordinary. We'd just published this paper in Nature Microbiology, Nature, Nature Reviews Microbiology, showing that these, all of these different factors have to come together to allow spillover from an animal to a human or here from a, a bat to a horse. And this really played out within this paddock. Next. My, my slide looks like it has, um, it's all moved around here. So I'll explain what, what this is, what we're, we're seeing. We predicted that cluster of spillover events in 2017, that one that killed the, the lady's horse. And we did it by amassing um, multiple data sets. They were collected or collated by my colleague, Dr. Peggy Eby in Australia, 16 data sets over, over 24 years. 
And through this information and machine learning approaches, we've been able to show that we can predict these spillover events through variables that show that bats are having uh, nutritional stress events, food shortage, acute food shortages. So we see more bats coming into rehabilitation. We see bats um, having a poor reproductive success. And we also see a climatic trigger of a high ONI. We see a high, um, uh, and it's an index of the El Nino cycles, seeing that there's been a high temperature in the Pacific Ocean in the, the previous year. Next. Um, my, my slide, I'm very sorry, they're, they're, they're actually, um, I've lost my winter slide here, but here I'm showing you that the root cause of this problem is a loss of the winter habitat that bats rely on. On the right here, you can see the red is the summer habitat of bats, the, 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 the distribution of the trees that flower in summer. And on the right, if it was, if it was white, you would see just tiny specks of red where the winter habitat, the, the, the eucalypt trees that provide flowers and nectar in winter exist. And in some areas of the range that we work in, 96% of winter flowering habitat has been lost next. What we understand has happened is because of these climatic cycles and this loss of this critical habitat is the bats have changed from big nomadic populations that move constantly across the landscape, feeding in native forests on nectar to fissioning into tiny populations in urban areas and agricultural areas. And previously, food shortages did happen with climatic cycles, but bats would re-amass into these nomadic populations when nectar flowed again. And now what we're seeing is the bats staying fissioned in these small populations in agricultural and urban areas, and those populations are the cause of spillover. Next. What this looks like across the, the, the Australian landscape is um, a proliferation of small flying fox camps. So all of those red dots you see on the right, many of those are new flying fox populations. Next. Next. We put GPS collars on bats in these new populations that have formed. And we're seeing this pattern that when there is a food shortage, the bats are feeding in horse paddocks. They're feeding in agricultural areas and weedy species that are there because of humans. But when nectar does flow again in native forests, the bats will fly right over those weedy species and feed in native forests on nectar. Next. So essentially, bats are having closer contact now with humans because of this dynamic. Next. But we also understand they're also shedding more virus. Next. And we understand this by these long-term studies of the virus within the populations, showing on the y-axis there when high viral shedding or low viral shedding over time. And that highest dot there in the top left-hand corner is the bats from that population near the horse I showed you, where over 60% of the urine pools we tested were positive for Hendra virus. And when they're shedding Hendra virus, you can see at the bottom, the different colors there are different paramyx of viruses. They're shedding multiple pathogens at the same time, not just Hendra virus. Next. So how do we prevent pandemics? Next. In 2020, we actually predicted another lot of Hendra virus spillover events. And we put warnings out to horse owners, next. But we had one spillover event and then it all stopped. And we now understand the reason is because there was a, a, a large pulse of winter flowering, something that happens rarely. And over 200,000 bats amassed at this large eucalypt flowering event. Actually, over 70% of one of the teropa species in Australia amassed around this winter flowering event. And we think that stops spillover. Next. And we've now noted that when there are these big pulses of winter flowering, there are not spillover events. This is work from my colleague Peggy Eby in Australia. When the spotted gum flowers, we don't see Hendra virus spillover event. So this provides a potential solution. We restore that winter habitat that they've lost and we think we could actually stop spillover. Next. And this is my last slide. 
So what we've been able to do from developing long-term data sets in both the reservoir host and the virus, we're really being able to, to understand this system and what this root cause is. By addressing that root cause, we can restore landscape immunity, essentially allowing bats to be able to feed, to gain the nutrition they need without having to come into human areas and having that increased proximity that increases spillover risk. Thank you. Thank you, Raina. This was excellent. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, <clears throat> we now move to Daniel. Daniel, the screen is yours now. Can we have his presentation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Garo. And uh, that was really an incredible presentation. And I'm, I'm happy to disclose that some of the conclusions or the messages are very much aligned to what Dr. Reiner just presented. So it's, it's, it's kind of soothing to be in front of an expert on these topics. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I'm uh, briefly going to present today uh, the work that uh, we are doing at the World Bank on, on emerging infectious diseases uh, with some, some messages and some key topics that are applicable at a global scale. And then I would give a, a, a few uh, thoughts about a project that we are implementing at the moment in, in China. That's where I am based at the moment in the country office in, in Beijing. Uh, next slide, please. So this is really just a summary of what we have heard in the previous presentation in a much better way. The majority of emerging infectious diseases originate in wildlife. And these emerging infectious diseases are increasing in frequency over time. There are seven papers that are assessed to that. And uh, those that are coming directly from wildlife are, in, are increasing more rapidly in, in, in comparison. Uh, there are a number of uh, examples or causes, uh, economic, uh, ecological, social, uh, demographic, etc., that increase exposure to wildlife, and we've seen some of those. Um, and some of the ones that we are more interested in are, are around wildlife trade, biodiversity loss, food systems, climate change, and, and, and other, other elements. And also, as, as uh, we've already seen at the very introduction that Garo made, and that we're going to see also in the next slide, China and Southeast Asia are hotspots for zoonotic diseases. So the next slide uh, will show that. And uh, it's at least in part due to all this uh, process of habitat fragmentation, habitat loss, uh, deforestation, forest uh, degradation. And just thinking about it, when you have more, more degradation, you have more uh, edges, forest, forest edges where there is a increased contact between, between wildlife and either domestic animals or, or human populations. Next slide, please. Um, so I think for, for, for practitioners, what, what, what do we do? What are some of the issues? What are some of the things we can do to prevent and manage some of these zoonotic uh, spillovers and these zoonotic uh, emerging infectious diseases? And uh, I've read a lot of literature recently, as, as, as I assume most of us, and I found three, a way and a paper that really articulates very nicely a, a thought process on how we can tackle this situation as practitioners in, in the development world. And, and this is by dividing, thinking about the reservoir hosts or, or the wildlife. This is where the pathogen exists. Uh, thinking about the interface between the wildlife and the livestock or wildlife and human, or thinking about the human by itself. And I think this also goes along the lines of what uh, Dr. Reiner was mentioning before about the infection, the shedding, the contagion, and then the spread. So if we think about the reservoir host, uh, this is where all the nice measures around biodiversity protection, protected areas, ecosystem restoration, uh, augmentation of, of natural enemies of those uh, species that could be risky, etc., would, would come in. And this is where also the research we just heard is, is extremely handy. How, how can you come up with natural ecological measures to, to restore an ecosystem that has been destabilized uh, to prevent uh, that spillover risk? And some, you know, in, in the past, there are have been other efforts, no, please, let's just stay. Some efforts, for example, on mass vaccination or on culling of individuals. This typically does not bode very well because this is, again, adding more distress to an already distressed system. 
if we think about the interface between the, the wildlife and the livestock or the wildlife and the human, um, one of the things that quickly comes to mind is that artificial uh, interface that is created by the wildlife trade or the movement of, of, of wildlife uh, around regions and, and continents. Uh, another interface is, is food systems or, or food securities where uh, we very often come into contact with, with, with food and food that comes from, from wildlife. Um, we could think about zoning or regulations, for example, whenever we know of the existence or the presence of, of risky populations, we could just zone them and make sure, like we did with the Hendra virus, well, let's just not make sure that the, the horses don't overlap with, with, the, with the roosting bats, or like they did with the Nipah virus, in, if I'm not mistaken, in Malaysia, when uh, pigs, pig farms were entering into contact again with, with, with bats and they were eating the fruit, they were, they were creating those risks. So let's reconsider where you are settling your, your pig farms, for example. And then lastly, think about the, if we think about the human population, this is typically where we put all the resources and all the effort when it's already a bit too late. And here, where, when, when you come up with things like vaccinations, drugs, hygienic measures, and an important one that I highlighted here is human behavior modification. It's around demand reduction of wildlife products, uh, risk awareness, and education of the public about certain risks of, of contact. Next slide, please. So, um, and this all comes together in the One Health approach, and uh, you will hear a lot about this in this conference, but uh, one of the many definitions is around human, plant, and animal health are interdependent. And um, at the same time, um, they are also um, interlinked, and uh, they are bound to the health of the ecosystem and the landscape in which they coexist. So, is necess necessary and is completely needed to, to include wildlife concepts and wildlife uh, health and wildlife risk into uh, one health approach. And it's quite interesting or, or even shocking, I would say, how wildlife being the main cause of these uh, very risky events uh, is usually the, the least developed uh, discipline in this one health uh, approach. Next slide. So we are, we are, we're only halfway through the presentation, but I'm already gonna give you the, the, the takeaways. And uh, I actually wrote three takeaways on the title, but I got excited and I ended up writing four. Uh, and then one, one piece of homework. But uh, the, the first takeaway is prevention is key. The prevention of, we, we know some of the causes of these events and we can prevent them before it is too late. Uh, but to do that, a long-term strategy is needed to understand the underlying causes the factors and the behaviors and systematically reduce the underlying risk. And we just heard before how complex these can be and how a specific mechanism or pathway could be really complex and really difficult to, to understand in full. Also linked to that, we can't prevent what we don't know. Uh, and at the moment, we still have lots of uncertainties and lots of uh, areas for further investigation. Um, the wildlife uh, health and disease information systems, in many of the countries and developing countries are not fully developed or are not there at all. And these are needed to better understand where the risks are and what some of the elements to start understanding uh, warning systems, etc. The third point is biodiversity is good. It's biodiversity per se <laughs> is not, not the problem. The risks are created when we destabilize their environments, is when we make changes in the ecology and the evolution of infectious diseases. And then lastly, uh, the, the trick is to reduce exposure. Uh, these spillover events can really be minimized by reducing exposure and sometimes by really simple and very uh, non-costly uh, operations or interventions. And the, the one piece of homework for, for all of us is we, we really, and now I'm talking a bit to the developing world and to biodiversity specialists, protection, protected area management specialists, we really need to raise up to the challenge and better build up the practice of the One Health and the introduction, systematic introduction of wildlife health considerations into uh, these discussions. Now the next slide, I will briefly present uh, the, the, the China project. And um, this project, we try to bring some of these uh, lessons and takeaways that I just mentioned. It's a $300 million project that was approved in June. And one of the interesting things is that 
it was really prepared jointly with the government of China as a, an emergency response to the situation. And this is important because it was recognized that prevention and rebuilding with that prevention uh, as a core principle was uh, fundamental. It's a multi-sectoral uh, project that includes uh, human health, it includes agriculture and livestock, and it includes environment uh, practices. And uh, it's targeting the strengthening and the intercoordination of these sectors that I just mentioned around livestock, wildlife, and human health. The specific objective is to strengthen selected national and provincial systems in China to pilot a multi-sectoral approach to reducing the risk of zoologic and, uh, zoonotic and other emerging health threats. It's divided into four components and the components reflect a bit some of these priorities. The first component is about improving risk-based surveillance systems. We need to better understand where the risks are and how we can tackle them. The second component is about prevention and control programs. It's actually doing some of these uh, interventions to minimize risk. And the third component is about institutional strengthening, human resource development, uh, training consistent with the One Health approach. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I'm giving a little bit more detail. Uh, the surveillance systems, what, what do we mean by that? Uh, we, we are talking about risk mapping and hotspot analysis of high-risk wildlife species. And we saw some uh, maps in the previous presentations is identifying where you have some uh, higher risks of, of presence of species that could carry pathogens. Not all species uh, carry the same types of pathogens with the same risks. Uh, to, to humans. Um, we, in China, uh, there is a quite developed uh, national and regional terrestrial wildlife disease monitoring network with uh, specific uh, staffing and, and instrumentation, but this needs to be strengthened and, and improved. And uh, with this information, we can start understanding some of the exposure maps and pathways, both to livestock and to human populations and develop data sharing platforms and early warning systems. Prevention and control programs could be a little bit targeted once you better understand your risks, but uh, in broader terms, we do have a, a component on national and provincial communication sensitization programs about the risks of, of consum consuming or eating some kind of wildlife or the risks uh, of some kind of interaction with wildlife. And then elements around limiting exposure through wildlife. And uh, one of them is on, on rescue centers. And this calls the attention of some, why are you building rescue centers? is because sometimes wildlife, um, for example, from breeding facilities, et cetera, it, it can be released, especially if it's sick, if it's sick or diseased, it doesn't make money to the owners and sometimes it's just uh, kicked out the door. And if you don't capture and you quarantine and you observe this wildlife, you are, you are, you are bringing risks to the population. And then uh, other programs to decouple uh, that presence of, for example, bats and, and pigs or, or bats and humans, etc. Institutional strengthening and human resources development is fundamental. It's very hard to find, it's very easy to find very good veterinarians and uh, the veterinarian practice is very well established and developed, but it's much harder to find good wildlife veterinarians and uh, even harder to find wildlife veterinarians with a specific knowledge of spillover and, and relationship with, with human health. So all these uh, issues around uh, reviewing guidelines and protocols for human exposure to wildlife, quarantine, veterinarian um, uh, regulations, etc., and uh, very strong training are extremely important. Next slide. Uh, so just to finish and, and in conclusion, uh, there is a large potential to support countries to better manage the wildlife resources, not only from a protection and conservation point of view, but also from a understanding the health risks uh, that may arise from wildlife. Uh, and the potential for joint interventions is huge. Uh, talking to livestock experts, to, to talking to epidemiologists and human health experts is, is really fundamental, is really key for all of us as a community to understand each other and to understand what we, we need from each other. Uh, there is a real and high need to sustainable, sustainable attention, training, financing, corporations, etc. Typically, we go through these cycles of uh, panic and neglect. During the panic phase, we throw a lot of money into it, then a few years pass by and then we neglect, we forget. And again, we, we miss out on the longer term important root causes and how to address them. 
and uh, a real paradigm shift is needed for practitioners working on the wildlife protection into one health and, and risk management. Um, thank you very much, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we first heard from Raina on the basis and the science. We heard from Daniel a good example of how this can be uh, translated into practical projects. And Dan Daniel's project is in China is more focused on wildlife uh, management and wildlife trade for the obvious reasons that he explained. So we're now gonna go and switch gears and hear from Urvash and Arin on the other side that uh, Dr. Reiner uh, presented, which is maintaining the integrity of the landscape or the conservation area. And one of the tools that we can do that is by promoting nature-based tourism. So Urvash is gonna explain uh, present what we have done on this and how the tool works and the challenges we're having. Thank you, Urvashi, for uh, agreeing to do this. You have uh, 15 minutes, okay, so that we're going to have 30 minutes for questions. And uh, those in the audience, uh, please keep sending your, uh, your questions through the Q&A box and vote on the questions that you already like. Okay, thank you. Urvashi, the screen is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Garo. I hope uh, you can hear me. Um, Loud and clear. Wonderful. Okay, so um, I'm going to take you uh, away a little bit away from uh, zoonotic diseases. I mean, absolutely fascinating presentations. Um, as an economist, I learned so much uh, from these two past presentations uh, and the video as well. Uh, but now moving on to something a little more, uh, a little different. Um, as we know, um, you know, healthy landscapes are also the basis of nature-based tourism. And nature-based tourism is an important source of revenue, both for conservation, but also for local communities and frankly for national governments. Um, and this is a growing sector. Now, we all, uh, as you know, we are all aware, uh, this is a sector that's been devastated by the pandemic, you know, the lack of uh, ability of people to travel, uh, sort of the lockdown um, has affected the sector at all levels. There's no demand, uh, you know, for the local tourism operators, but also conservation uh, resources um, and finance is drying up. So um, as countries look uh, towards economic recovery, um, this is a sector that they need to really pay close attention to. Um, and what we'd like to share with you today is some of the tools and resources that uh, these countries and practitioners and policymakers could draw upon as they plan the economic recovery of this sector. So as I mentioned, something a little different from what you heard in your previous two conversations, but I hope this will be, um, you will find this useful. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, before I uh, dive into our, uh, this toolkit that we've developed, um, I just want to give you a little bit of background. Um, so initially, um, you know, over the last few years, we have seen a real uptake um, in demand from our countries for uh, working with the World Bank on nature-based tourism. They see both that uh, nature-based tourism is good for development, but also good for conservation. And, uh, you know, the growing, this is a growing sector. Of course, it's been uh, affected by the pandemic, but it will come back. And at the World Bank, uh, we um, are looking to promote uh, nature-based tourism following three principles. And these are very much uh, linked to uh, the first is uh, to protect the asset. And this, you know, talks very much to the focus of the session today. Um, uh, we need healthy landscapes. We need healthy protected areas because that is the basis on which the tourism offering is based. And unless you have healthy um, and well-maintained protected areas, the tourists are not going to come. So, you know, maintaining and protecting the, uh, these areas, these natural assets is very important. Um, equally important is uh, to what we call uh, to grow uh, the business sustainably, meaning 
there has to be an interesting and high quality um, offering of tourism uh, services uh, in these areas. You know, unless, I mean, you may have the most pristine um, landscapes, but if there's no tourism services, whether that's hotels or restaurants, nobody, you know, you will not have tourists come. So you also need to grow the business sustainably. And last and definitely not the least is it is very important to share the benefits from this nature-based tourism. We have found across the world, a lot of uh, very poor communities live around these protected areas and in these landscapes. And um, it is important that uh, some of the benefits of the tourism sector come to these local communities. So that's sort of when we uh, design our projects or engage with countries, we um, try um, to you know, emphasize that the natural asset must be protected, the business uh, uh, of tourism must be promoted, and then there must be very clean, clear ways in which communities can also benefit from uh, the tourism offering. Now, um, as part um, of the pandemic, uh, because of the pandemic, of course, you know, this, um, this chain has been broken in many parts, right? First of all, um, we are seeing that uh, finance for, to, uh, for conservation is drying up. Oftentimes, uh, many of these protected areas get their finance through the visitors who come to these areas and pay um, an entry fee. Without any tourists, we are seeing a decline um, in uh, the finance and therefore some level of decline in protection uh, for these assets. Uh, the chain um, is also broken on, uh, on, the, um, uh, on the enterprises, the tourism enterprises. You know, without having the tourists come, uh, these businesses are suffering uh, terribly. And uh, finally, um, you know, without the tourism business, without sort of the financing to uh, cons conserve the protected areas, communities are also not benefiting. So this chain is broken by the pandemic. And as countries think about recovery, we are urging that they think about what we are calling a green recovery, where they can rebuild and protect these assets. They can support businesses to grow more sustainably and they can also provide both short-term benefits to communities um, through, say, employment, but also think of strengthening their policies so that the benefits can uh, flow to communities. So, you know, there is a lot that has happened because of the pandemic to this sector and a lot that countries need to do. So, um, and this is very much, you know, part of some of the advice that our countries are asking uh, from the World Bank. But this is also, you know, even with us not being involved, these are issues that countries are grappling with. So the question is, how can they do this? Next slide, please. So um, at the World Bank, um, over, uh, just recently, we've launched uh, what we call the Tools and Resources for Natural uh, Nature-Based Tourism. And this is just a wealth of information that we have tried to collate and bring under one platform that provides uh, all sorts of material to governments who are, of course, this is relevant, you know, uh, at times, uh, you know, outside the pandemic, but very, very relevant during the time of the pandemic as well. Uh, the report uh, contains, you know, as listed here, different types of materials, um, over 360 information resources. There's information on certification systems, on toolkits, on how-to tools. It also provides a lot of links to training materials, to online platforms, and to relevant institutions and networks who are also working, who um, teams can collaborate with. And of course, there's much, much more material on, say, sustainable tourism but our effort was to bring together the information on nature-based uh, tourism. And that's how we sort of uh, collated some of this information. Next slide, please. So turning from uh, the types um, of materials to the thematic areas, there's a number of different thematic areas that are covered as listed here. We have information on enabling policy environments, on um, you know, how you manage destinations, 
what kind of infrastructure and facilities um, uh, that can be sustainable, can be provided and so on and so forth as listed here. For today's presentation, and given the devastating impact of the pandemic on this sector, I want to focus on four um, of these uh, thematic areas. Next slide, please. And these are, um, as highlighted here, uh, the enabling policy environment, uh, visitor management, impacts of nature-based tourism, and risk management and climate change. But as I mentioned, there's lots of other material, but today, just to give you a little bit of a flavor for what kind of information there is, I wanted to focus on these four. Next slide, please. So coming first to the enabling policy environment. Now, um, governments um, uh, and protected area authorities need guidance now more than uh, ever on the policies that they can use to support tourism, but also to respond to uh, COVID-19. So the report, um, and this is just one example on the screen, but the report provides tools to help policy uh, makers develop policies through participatory processes to promote sustainability. It also provides examples of policies that can be developed across the world that, that have been developed across the world that can be used as reference material. So for example, the policy in Namibia has been praised for its consideration both for environmental and community um, engagement. And we have provided um, a link to this policy um, as part of these tools. Next slide, please. Then we also provide a wealth of information on visitor management um, as part of this uh, toolkit. You know, um, there is both, I think, going to be an increase in uh, visitation once travel opens up and people are feeling comfortable once again to travel. I think, um, you know, given the ability to be outside and not in enclosed areas, I think we are going to see just a growth in this sector. And so park managers and governments will need to know how to manage uh, the visitors who are going to come, how to prevent congestion, how to uh, prevent sort of the degradation um, of the resource. So for example, here in our, under the to visitor management section, we have shared tools that include congestion management toolkit. There's a visitor use management framework and so on and so forth. So a lot of information that again, um, uh, practitioners can draw upon to, um, as they both uh, help their sector to recover and the likely sort of increase in visitation that they're going to see. Next slide, please. Um, then we have another section that talks about the impact and provides sort of um, a glimpse into the different types of tools that governments and practitioners can use uh, to estimate uh, the um, impact uh, of nature-based tourism. Now, why is this important? Um, what, you know, for example, this um, slide is showing you is that um, this is for the US uh, Park Service. And this shows that um, every, uh, in 2018, the US parks generated uh, $20.2 billion in benefits for the local economy. Now, typically when one thinks about the revenue of parks, one thinks of what visitors bring a pay when they come to parks. But what this kind of analysis has shown is that that is just the tip of the iceberg. Visitors, when they come to these areas, they stay in hotels, they go to restaurants, um, and that generates more revenue for the local area. Then the restaurants will hire, um, uh, you know, labor, they will uh, source local goods. That leads to further multipliers um, and e further economic benefits. Now, it is important for governments both in, at this time of the pandemic, therefore to understand not only what is the loss of revenue for park, um, parks through reduce in visitors, but also the spillover loss in, in uh, uh, spillover economic impact on the local community. Um, because then it, you know, as they design the economic recovery programs, it will be important 
that they understand all the different uh, parts of the local economy, the different communities, the different types of households who have been negatively impacted. And the tools that we've provided under this section uh, uh, you know, gives uh, examples and then links also to how this can be done. Next slide, please. Um, uh, Vashi, sorry that you are the last speaker. So uh, you have five more, five more minutes. I, this is fascinating, but uh, it can go longer. So sorry. no, no, I have, I, I will be done well in time, Baro. Not to worry. Um, and um, and then the last sort of little bit of information I want to give you a glimpse into is that we have included lots of different ways in which uh, uh, parks um, can manage risks that are associated say through tourism or um, other kinds of risks. And this is the section on risk management uh, and climate change. And um, so uh, next slide, please. So these are sort of a glimpse into some of the thematic areas that are relevant as countries begin to um, recover this sector. But we also have a, you know, a wealth of information on different types of trainings that are um, available number of there's a lot of the free online courses that are available to um, you know practitioners to park managers um, to governments uh, to NGOs that they can use um, to uh, you know strengthen their skills um, uh, as well and next slide please and finally um, we have provided sort of a wealth of information on the different um, institutions that are working on these topics and the different networks that exist. Uh, because, um, you know, sharing of information, sharing of knowledge is um, a very critical part of being able to do this and to do this well. And so here we've just given you a glimpse of, um, you know, uh, the different networks and institutions that fall under the letter G um, and there's just as many for every different letter of the alphabet. Um, and so, again, a wealth of information for where one can turn to for help and who is doing what kind of work. Next slide, please. And what we have also done um, is that related to this uh, book, we have converted it into an ebook resource. So all of these uh, resources are now available um, online um, and uh, accessible uh, widely. So people can search by thematic area or by the type of resource or by uh, keyword, and then uh, provide, then actually go to uh, the specific, um, say toolkit that is referred to, or um, uh, next slide, please. You can see an example. For example, um, you'll come up once you pick the thematic area or the type of resource you're interested in, or if you do a search, you'll get this kind of a box. And then if you click on one of the boxes, you will be taken directly to that resource. So, um, you know, in this time I'll wrap up, uh, you know, where there is a need and countries will have to focus on rebuilding um, the uh, nature-based tourism sector. Uh, we, we hope that this kind of a resource uh, where, that provides information at the fingertips of policymakers will be useful. Okay, thanks, Garo. Back to you. Thanks, Urvashi. This is excellent, and I hope people come and use the tool. This is a very, this was great work, and I hope the tool is very useful. Uh, I want to add one aspect of this that people have to think. It's uh, we're doing this because of the natural asset. And also when we have protected areas and the natural assets and the tourists, poaching decreases. Because of course, you have more people there, more people visiting, the, the, the risk of being caught increases a lot and the interest of the, of the people to maintain the wildlife also increases. So we, we have a lot of, we heard a lot of anecdotal cases of poaching increases because if nobody is going there, it's a lot easier for the bad guys to move in, right? They don't quarantine themselves. So uh, that also affects biodiversity. So uh, thank you for this. Uh, and before we move into the question, I wanna, I wanna say that the, the bank is not only talking about this, we also do something about it. As, as you saw from China's project and also from what Vasha was saying in Nature Based Tourism. So in that, in that regard, 
can I have, we have two large programs that we have started that support landscape, but within the landscape, we are supporting the biodiversity and landscape aspects of the One Health approach that Daniel mentioned. Can I have the two slides, please? The, So we have a, a program called ProGreen, which is a platform for landscape management. And the objective is to maintain and improve ecosystem services in resilient production and conservation landscapes. Of course, in order to do that, we have to work with uh, intensifying agriculture in, in the existing areas so they don't, don't deforest other areas. So you maintain the habitat. We do land restoration when it's necessary. So we plant trees. And of course, we have to manage the biodiversity properly or maintain the biodiversity. So these programs are to enable the country to have their national development objectives, as Urvashi was mentioning, and delivering the global commitments. They have commitments for climate change. They have commitments for biodiversity in the NBCFs. They have commitments of a born challenge. All those commitments together, if you look at it, that are they, they have an angle of improving the quality of the landscape and the quality of the habitat. And all of them will decrease the chances of the spillover. So we do this. Uh, not only by supporting projects, but I like to emphasize the last bullet, which is support systemic changes in countries and policies and institutions. And this is important because sometimes the problem is agriculture subsidy, is a tax reform, is a customs agency that doesn't know how to deal with trade of wildlife. And, all, and we can't just focus on the environmental and biodiversity agency. To address it, the, the issues we discussed today, the ones that Ryan and talk about it, look at, you know, it's going to horses. This is not dealt with, it's not an issue that is dealt by the environmental agency or the forest agency. So we need to have a One Health approach, but we have to look at the environment in a, in a broader sense and program support countries to do that. The other program that we have Next slide, please, is the one that we started with a GEF, uh, with the GEF Cent Fund, which is called FOLUR, Food Systems for Land Use and Restoration Impact Program. We manage the global platform and is leveraging $3 billion, not only from the bank, but from the other agencies as well, but we, uh, the bank, manages the overall platform. And the idea is the same, is promote sustainable integrated landscapes and efficient value chain at scale. So if we do this, we have sustainable food system promoted, the forestation free sub supply chains promoted. So that again, decreases the pressure over new areas, which we heard today how, how big it is. And if you look at the last, last bullet, landscape scale and restoration promoted and pr for production and ecosystem services. Again, they are degraded areas. We increase the stress of the animals. We increase animal shedding. Uh, we lose biodiversity. We have studies that show that, you know, when you increase the number of animals, but decrease the number of species, that means you decrease by the diversity uh, in an area, that also is a reason for uh, increase the risk of spillover. So I just want to show you that we're doing this in both programs for Lur and Pro Green are embedded into how the World Bank operates with the programs that you know, Urvashi works on, natural capital accounting and other, other environmental economics so that we try to build this into the concept of sustainability in the long term. Uh, with that, uh, I wanna come back to open up for questions. And the most popular question is with 12 votes so far is, from an ecological standpoint, what can world leaders and decision makers learn from the consequences we face due to the current pandemic? I'll read it again. From an ecological standpoint, what can world leaders and decision makers learn from the consequences we face due to the current pandemic? Dr. Reina, uh, maybe I can ask you to answer that one. Yeah, I would say my first thought is that prevention is so much cheaper than allowing these processes to take place. And that even though it's it's really difficult, prevention is difficult and so context dependent, there are general principles that we can adhere to. Um, intactness of landscapes, maintaining ecological integrity, allowing, trying to reduce the situations where animals and people come into proximity with each other. So reducing the edges, reducing fragmentation, 
reducing high risk contacts of, of um, within the wildlife trade. So there are the general principles and it's what we're calling landscape immunity of maintaining landscape immunity that will reduce the risk of pathogen spillover. And although they're enormous and expensive, they're nothing like as expensive as the consequences of a pandemic. And there will be more pandemics. I mean, we, we know it's, it's just a matter of time before we have SARS-CoV-3 or a Hendipa virus or another an influenza virus that, that has a similar situation. Thank you. Uh, Brooklyn, or you haven't spoken, but you know, you feel free to answer a question if you want to jump in. Uh, Dan, you want to, Daniel, you want to answer too? Sure. I think in addition to that one, which to me is fundamental, I'd say two more. One is the key importance of, of science. And it's almost, it's, it's terrifying almost when you read some papers published months before the occurrence of COVID already stressing the presence of coronavirus in serological samples in Chinese populations in Southern China. So this was known by, and this is published in high impact, uh, you know, scientific journals. Uh, but yet, and, and there were some loud voices saying, guys, we have a risk here, but yet it wasn't given the, 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 the prominence and the importance it should have been given as we now see. And then the other, I guess, the other very important thing to me is the, we tend to talk about global public goods or things that are good for the planet as such. This type of situation is a global public bad and we should all be invested in it. It doesn't matter what part of the world uh, an emergence happens. If we don't control it, we are all in it. So we should come up together in with, uh, you know, international cooperation agreements and, and support and joint research, joint sharing, joint platforms to tackle these risks that are monumental and we are, we are blind to them. Okay, uh, let me add to this before I, I pass on to the next question, which is, all of you connected, all the 450 people connected on this phone, on this uh, meeting, you are now ambassadors. You are now being <laughs> named ambassadors for this agenda because what happened, and, and we keep saying this, is, is one every 100 years, right? This is the one every 100 years. The other one was the influenza back in 1918. So what the government's decision leaders will not make decisions for the things we're discussing if they think this is high impact, but low probability. It's like us, you know, okay, if, if we are hit by a lightning, we're gonna die, but the probability of being hit by a lightning is so low that we don't care about it. So if the decision makers continue to think that the probability of having another pandemic is very, very low, doesn't matter how the impact of this one uh, took place, people would not make, uh, would not act. So the information we heard today, the studies that uh, Dr. Reiner did, the, the work we're doing, I think this is the sort of thing that we have to keep bringing up to decision makers, which are beyond the ones that work on environment. Otherwise, uh, it's just gonna be a missed opportunity. People say, okay, it happened a pandemic, you know, but you know, it's once every 100 years, so why would I bother? And that's why some offices and some prevention work uh, is not taking place. Uh, I'll go to the next question. The next question, I think it goes directly to Urvashi. Uh, how do we make ecotourism possible in African rainforest? That's nine votes. <laughs> um, you know, it's a very specific question, but uh, I think um, the, uh, it is, you know, it gets down to the principles that I think we were, I began with, right? To, uh, it's important that those rainforests be well protected, right? First and foremost. So you have to protect what we call the asset. Then the second thing is you have to create the conditions where tourists can come and want to come. So that means you have to create the infrastructure. You have to make it accessible, right? You need roads that will bring the tourists there. You need the private sector to come in and provide high quality, good quality um, uh, hotels, restaurants, right? Uh, tourists have to want to come uh, to this area and ecotourism will not happen if you don't get the tourists to come. And uh, so, you know, you protect the asset, but then what we call grow the business. So you need to invest in infrastructure, 
but also create the conditions for the private sector to come in um, uh, in a way that is sustainable so that they are not depleting or damaging uh, the asset, but they are providing the services that the tourists will want, which will bring the tourist to um, the rainforest. And finally, I think it is so important that we don't promote what is called this enclave tourism, right? Where you just have the tourists come fly into the tourism resort, all the uh, inputs and the labor for the tourism resort comes from outside. So the local communities are not benefiting um, at all. So I think the third part of promoting ecotourism in say the rainforests in Africa would be to really you know, think about how we can strengthen the linkages between the tourism sector and the local communities. And that can be through uh, sourcing of labor from the local communities, which in turn may require some upskilling of the, uh, you know, the, uh, of the uh, labor there, but it could also be sourcing of agricultural produce. So to me, you know, the protect the asset, grow the business and share the benefits. Those are the three principles that we need to follow. Back to you. Thank Karen. you, Vash, you're very clear. Uh, next question uh, goes back to Dr. Reina, I believe. Regarding mountain hiking and climbing outdoor works, uh, has these activities or have these activities been found to create zoonotic spillovers? Mm, that's a good question. I can't think of an example. Um, of course, any contact with wild animals has some level of risk. And um, if there would be zoonotic spillovers associated with, for example, Q fever, which is blown around in the wind by being outside. So there would be examples where being out in the environment increases zoonotic risk. But say the high risk situations for zoonotic spillover wouldn't be hiking and outdoor activities. There would be activities where there's a close contact with a contaminated surface or a close contact with an infected animal. So for example, hunting, um, bushmeat consumption, or um, thinking of uh, any, any sort of livestock maintenance, anything with close contact with animals. Uh, how about uh, how about Lyme disease? Would that be the case? Lyme oh. disease is actually a good example, right? So Lyme disease in the United States has a dynamic where we're seeing more risk in the environment as the diversity, biodiversity decreases because the animals that are very good hosts of Lyme disease are, tend to be competitive dominant. So they do really well in low diverse situations where the predators have, have disappeared. And so you do see an increased risk then of the, the ticks uh, biting humans, those ticks being more likely to be infected in those low diverse areas because they're, they're good hosts do well in those areas. So that would be actually an example where being in those specific contexts outside would have an increased risk of zoonotic spillover. That will also be the case of you decrease diversity so you increase the population of few species and you decrease diversity of, of the entire set of animals there. That also increases the risk of a spillover. Right? Decreasing diversity can increase risk of spillover in situations where the hosts that are very competent for the disease do really well in situations where there is um, a lot of human disturbance, a lot of fragmentation, low diversity. So there are a number of examples of, of that. There is an intense debate um, about this. There are situations where a highly diverse landscape actually would have higher disease risks for certain pathogens. And we tend to see the emergence of the new pathogens coming from high diverse areas that are experiencing rapid landscape change. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Carol, I, I, just a, just I, yes, a, go ahead. Just a Please. quick note. As far as I know, there have been some description of cases of people going into caves uh, you know, when they, for example, for one or collection or, or things like that. So sometimes if you're an speleologist and you like going into caves, uh, that's, uh, that's, that could be an increased uh, risk of, uh, as Dr. Reiner that mentioned. Too. For sure, yeah. Yep, that too. Uh, thank you for that, Daniel. Actually, I have a question for you. I have other questions, but I have a specific question for you. I was hoping it would come up, but 
uh, is a very specific one is what are the challenges in working with it? Or you want to say something, Brookie? I had just a little tidbit to add about, okay. you know, hiking, outdoor activity. Um, Raina and I were just working on a, like a philosophical paper with some collaborators and I read a bunch of literature kind of on this. Um, there's been some connections where really high land use in terms of like recreational activities. So lots of hiking, lots of um, like um, four wheeling and things have been connected to higher prevalences of Yersinia pestis, which causes plague. Um, so I know that down in, I believe it's Utah, there's been some correlations there. And then there's also correlations with marmot hunting over in, I believe it's Kazakhstan with the same pathogen. Okay, but we still can go outdoors, guys. Don't, don't get too scared off. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Dan. I, I feel I have another one from the audience, but I have one for you just so that we can move to the question from the audience, Daniel, is uh, on practical terms, what was the challenge in working with the experts from uh, an advanced to one health approach in China? I mean, how, how, did the, how did the Chinese government took the idea of a one health approach with this cross sectorial goals like the culture, environment, health, uh, et cetera? Was it hard, was it easy? Yeah. The one of the main challenges is that uh, is the I would say is the lack of uh, models of well-functioning models elsewhere that that one could look into and say okay that's what I want to replicate or that's what I want to aspire to. So very often it's something that you know when you talk to decision makers is something that you also do with a fair bit of uh, sensitization and explaining and explaining. And uh, it's, but it's a, it's a, it's an elusive concept. What that means? How, how do we bring wildlife health into human health? How do we be ecosystem health? So, uh, I guess a challenge as well is the the lack of a, a real, or a very, it's just a very nascent practice, I would say. And uh, so it's still hard to find those uh, national experts who can directly talk to their own decision makers and, and, and explain the, the, the situation. In China, there are different, uh, you know, talking about China, it's, China is as huge as three Europe's, so all put together. So, you know, there are also some disparities. And for example, some provinces are way more advanced and they have a very visionary uh, understanding of the situation and, and whereas others are still lagging behind and are more, uh, focused on silos. And so sometimes, for example, when you talk about human health, it's hard for the human health practitioners to share information or even to sit on the same table as a, as a veterinarian, or it could sound even almost counterintuitive, although that's the way we need to move, move about. So that bringing together on the same table, practitioners are different as a, as a doctor and a, and a wildlife specialist, that's, that's the main challenge that we find every day. Thank you. I think find this is insightful as we move along and we have to promote this topic further, which is we need to think about how we're going to get this thing done. I'm going to go to two final questions here. I think uh, the first one, I think uh, everybody can answer if you wanted to. Do we need capacity building uh, in regarding to, to these tools for preventing future pandemics? Or do we need willingness? So is an issue of capacity building or is an issue of willingness? Uh, since you're still already in the screen, Daniel, maybe you can go first. Another that's can a, jump in later. That's, go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure, but that sounds to me like a heavily loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the, the, the natural answer is we need both. Um, capacity building is, is fundamental. And uh, we, we see that every single day, how, how little we know about, about these things, how, how much is still to, to learn and how much the practice is still to be developed. And where does a practitioner who wants to work in this topic, this topic study, where, where do you find your colleagues? Where do you find your fora, your institutions, your coordination mechanisms? So the whole structure around it needs to be, needs to be developed. Uh, willingness is also very important as we very often see how we all want to keep to our own silos and our own sectors and keep our information and not share with other colleagues. 
So the willingness to be open about this and to discuss this uh, transparently is also, is also very important. So I would give it a 50-50. I'd like oh, to yeah. add, add to that. Um, if we, to, to understand the, the context, the risks that are driving spillover, those first events that, that lead to the pathogen getting into the human population, We've got to, we've got to, re to understand how they're actually happening. We have to have data. And if we look at the areas where spillover is most likely to occur, we have almost no data. So I've been trying to find out how many bat biologists would there be in the area where the horseshoe bat resides. So Southern China, Northern Vietnam, um, Myanmar, Laos. And I, I haven't been able to get a number, but it could, it's probably going to be less than a dozen maybe it's maybe half a dozen. And, and if anyone knows, please let me know. <laughs> but with, without even knowing, well, we don't know what the species is, but without knowing anything about the ecology of these species, how they're reacting to land use change, what sort of pressures they're under, what the pathogens are doing when within the, in those species, it's very difficult to understand the risk. Um, there's been something like, there's been a handful of studies of coronaviruses in bats in situ in the wild. So we need to build the science capacity and those collaborative those interdisciplinary relationships to really understand what are those, those triggering factors. But then we're even trying to understand the, the viruses within the bats. We don't have reagents to really look at, for example, bat immune systems. Just very simple investment in, in something like you know, $50,000, $100,000 in, in reagents so that we could actually understand what's happening within bats. So we're not talking about huge investments. So um, I would say there has to be a capacity building in this area. Uh, uh, Urvashi, do you wanna, you wanna add to anything or we are done? No, I no, I think uh, all has been said. I completely agree with what you said. Yeah. I, I tend to think that the willingness has to come first because if there is no willingness, then the, the government's not gonna put money and so, yes, I think you need the money for the technical, for the capacity building, but they don't build the capacity if they don't have a willingness that this is a problem. So that's, money is always short. I think we have to, yes, but we need both. Uh, I, my fi uh, the final question we have is the current economic models, well, it's not the final, but it's the final that we can answer in the time that we have. Current economic models are responsible for land use change, which triggers origin of COVID, the origins of COVID-19 pandemic. Do you think that we need to change our approach for development? Then, Daniel, I know you like that answer, that question. How many more hours do we have to, to tackle that question? <laughs> I think we have our lead economist for the environment practice. I think that's an excellent question for her. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me just say a few words. Again, I think um, it, this is a, you know, like da Daniel said, this is, you know, we could spend hours on this question. But I think... Um, there is, uh, yes, the, you know, you could say you need a different uh, development model in the sense, a model that values uh, natural resources, right? But um, we also need uh, to sort of strengthen the economic case for why, um, uh, you know, investing in the environment is good for the economy. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, policymakers need to create jobs. They need to alleviate poverty. They need to uh, grow prosperity um, amongst their people. And, you know, if we can, and we can show how they can create jobs by investing in uh, the natural capital, then I think um, I wouldn't call it, you know, a completely different development model, but I would say it is a development model that uh, uh, appropriately values uh, natural resources and then brings uh, the value and the consequences of not managing that natural resources into decision making. So this is, for example, you know, Garo referred to this. We are doing a lot of work at the World Bank to, um, on what we call the Global Program for Sustainability, where we are trying to promote uh, um, the uh, system of environmental and economic accounts 
so that natural asset is properly valued and brought into decision making. So I think at the moment that aspect is lacking um, in our, uh, the way we manage uh, our economies. And the more that that is mainstreamed into our economic discourse, I think we will get more of a balance um, and we will see greater what we call greener growth um, happening as well. So um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Daniel is looking a little disappointed, no, no, so I'm not sure. It does. It does. We can continue this. Uh, and I think what you made a very good summary is not an either or. We have to have development with sustainability. And we can use this with the landscape approach, which is intensifying the use of the landscape, not destroying the landscape. I thank every one of the speakers and each one of those that are connected. I hope you learn a little bit on this and you log in on the tools and the presentation that we presented here so you can have more resources from Dr. Reiner's work, uh, the tourist work, the China work. And with that, thank you very much. Have a good, good day.